So Docker is something that we should really understand better before proceeding any further. So I want to cover Docker versus virtual machines, Docker file, how that works and what it means to be layer based, Docker hub, which is kind of like the repository of Docker images, and then orchestrating Docker containers via Kubernetes. So the foundational idea here is that there's no operating system, which means that your container is very lightweight. So to understand that, let's look at how a virtual machine works. So a virtual machine runs on a host operating system. The operating system runs on the, the hardware, the server. On top of the operating system, there's a hypervisor layer, which enables the VM to be very efficient and kind of access resources more efficiently than it otherwise would be able to. But crucially, the virtual machine itself packages up its own operating system with its own drivers to the hardware and, and uh, all that stuff. The way that Docker works is that you know, the, the bare metal server has an operating system on top of it. But then on top of that, there's the Docker engine. And on top of that, you have a Docker container, which does not include the operating system. It only includes the binaries and libraries that your application is going to need. And then it includes your application code. And so this makes it a lot more lightweight, which means it loads faster. It's uh, uh, smaller in size. And because of that, yeah, it omits the guest operating system. And because it's so lightweight, people have started using Docker containers a lot more than they ever used virtual machines because you can spin up a container for every single task that you're doing. So for example, in a uh, PHP, MySQL, you know, web, you know, old school web server stack, you might have a container that has PHP, MySQL running on uh, essentially Ubuntu. But then maybe there's uh, an image processing service that when users upload images, you uh, convert them to thumbnails and you store them somewhere else. That doesn't need PHP or MySQL. And if you're on a virtual machine, you might be tempted to like, just add it to the same virtual machine because you're already paying the price of the OS. But with Docker, you would just spin up another container which just has that image processing binary. And it's running on Alpine Linux, which is this like, super lightweight version of Linux. So yeah, a web app might have a web server container, a database container, a job queue container, and then a job worker container. The Docker file is the way that you specify Docker images. And a Docker image is what you use to spin up a Docker container. So uh, the Docker file starts with some kind of base image, usually. So here, they start with a Python 2.7 base image. We'll talk more about where that comes from on the next slide. You can set your working directory. You can add things from kind of your file system onto the Docker image. You can run commands like pip install, some number of packages. You can expose ports. Um, you can set environment variables. And then you can run, uh, like, by default, a command that will execute when the container spins up. And so then when I say Docker run and I give it the name of an image, what will happen is that Docker will read through the file, the Docker file that specifies the image. And each one of these lines essentially specifies a layer of the Docker image. And if the, the, the layers are cached, right? So let's say I only change that last line, the command python app.py. Maybe I want to change it to command python app2.py. When I run you know, docker build or docker run, it'll read that. It'll figure out that all of the lines refer to things that have already been done and cached, but that it's just that last line that changed. And so it'll change just the last layer of the system. So that's a nice thing, because it's just this whole kind of layer-based workflow that can really speed you up. And you can like, stand on the shoulders of giants, because people build, for example, Python images uh, those images probably start with like a basic Linux image and then install all the Python dependencies. And then they make that available. And then you can start from the Python image. So you don't have to worry about installing the Python dependencies. You can already assume it exists. And you package up your own stuff. And then maybe someone else on your team is going to use the image you created and then add something else to that. And in general, this, is whole, this whole notion of, an, of a Docker ecosystem, um, which is really quite strong. So the client, you can Docker build images, 
uh, pull images from the Docker host, which is usually Docker Hub, and then run images. So the images are easy to find, they're easy to modify, they're easy to contribute back to Docker Hub. So Docker Hub is kind of like GitHub for Docker images. And uh, very nicely, private images are just as easy to store in the same exact place as public images. So you can rely on some public images, you can modify them, and then make the resulting image private to you so that only you can use it in your continuous integration flows or just on your local machine or in your training workflow. So the reason I say it's very strong is because it's really been blowing up for the last few years. <coughs> so two years ago, there were already like 12 billion you know, pools of Docker images. Um, and so really, this is now the way to do development, is try to package it up in Docker as much as you can. So now that we've solved a problem that we used to have, which is you know, brittle dependency chains and uh, heavyweight virtual machines to handle them, we solved that problem with lightweight containers, and so now we have containers for every single task. But now we have a new problem, which is how do we actually orchestrate all of these containers that we now have? And so the new problem has a new solution, which is uh, you know, the problem is distributing containers onto the actual thing that is going to execute them. And the solutions that came out over the last few years are, are manifold. Uh, someone mentioned Mesos yesterday, Kubernetes, there's other ones. There's an Amazon Web Services specific one called Fargate, which is a cool spaceship. But, um, but Kubernetes seems to be the open source winner. So that like, if, you don't, if you're not on Amazon Web Services, where you can use that, uh, if you run it, for example, on your own premise hardware, then Kubernetes seems to be the way to go. But the cloud providers have good offerings as well. Of course, Kubernetes is by Google. So it's also their solution to this problem on Google Cloud Platform. So I want to pause here for questions. The question is around um, maybe a different workflow where you, um, every time you have a different machine learning model, you put it in a Docker container, and then you version the entire container as part of the production workflow. Um, do you see any issues with that, or is that something you'd recommend people do? It depends on your deployment methodology. Like, are, is the Docker container the thing that's going to get deployed? Yeah. yeah, if so, then it feels natural to version that. And that's, yeah, that's your artifact of your build system. And that's also exactly what you deploy. It feels great to version exactly that. I don't see any problem with that. Um, more and, thresholds. And, and in fact, like, that, that is the way you should do it. Not only is there no problem with it, but that is the right <laughs> thing to do. Um, the other questions that have come up so far on, are on ML test paper. I don't know how much more detail you want to go into in that. Um, I mean, you can ask it. Sure. Um, I may not know the answer. So setting loose, loose thresholds when monitoring models in production, what does that mean? Can you give an example? Um, yeah, so for example, you might be surprised if, so loose thresholds, that could be on the input data or on the prediction. So on the prediction, you might be surprised by an incredibly confident prediction or an incredibly not confident prediction um, just by observing like what you saw in your validation set. Maybe you have always see prediction confidence between you know, 0.5 and 0.8. And then all of a sudden in production, you get a 1.0. That would be alarming because what, what happened? Like you've never seen something like that in training. On the data, it could be interesting to, to have a threshold for maybe some basic statistic of the data. So for example, for images, um, you could sum up all the pixels. And what's the average pixel intensity? right? So it could be something like 0.5. That's the average pixel intensity. Uh, in your data set, and you've never seen an intensity over 0.9 or below 0.1. But then in production, you have 1.0. That means like the whole image is just pure black. So that could be something that is probably not a valid input. That would be my example. 